Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts called Menninger Mindscape. I'm Dr. John Oldham, professor of psychiatry at Baylor College of Medicine. It's been my pleasure to host this series of podcasts, and we have some very interesting discussion with our guest today. So welcome. This is Dr. Philip Shaw. We're delighted to have you with us today. Thanks very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. I'll tell you a bit about Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw is here actually as one of our speakers for the All Day Symposium tomorrow, which is our third annual national symposium that Menninger sponsors. And this one is going to be on emotion regulation and dysregulation. And we're delighted Dr. Shaw could join us. Dr. Shaw is at the National Institute of Health, and he works in the Human Genome Research Institute there. And one of the areas that he's very interested in is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or what's well known, I'm sure, to most of you as ADHD. And we're going to talk a little bit about that right now. Let me also tell you a little bit about Dr. Shaw's background. He has a degree from Oxford, and he's also um, been uh, at the Institute of Psychiatry in London, and he's currently a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and also the Royal College of Physicians in the UK. Um, how long have you been in this country? Uh, Eleven years. Eleven, Eleven years. years. Yeah. Well, you're, you're now a native. It's true. It's true. Actually, I'm eligible for citizenship. Well, is that a plan? I don't know. We'll see how the elections go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay, we won't go there. No, 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 we don't. <laughs> well, talk yeah. to us a little bit. This will be a preview of coming attractions. I hope some of you will be able to get to the uh, symposium tomorrow. But we want to just hear a little bit about the nature of the work that you'll be describing in more detail later on. Yeah, so I'm my research program uh, with my colleagues, we focus on ADHD. And as anyone who's ever met a group of children with ADHD will know, one of the most common problems that these kids present with are difficulties regulating their emotions. They can often be very irritable kids, lots of temper outbursts, really classic stuff that stems from an inability to regulate their emotions. And indeed, like uh, until relatively recently, you know, um, uh, problems with regulating emotion was actually a defining characteristic of ADHD and it sort of dropped out as cognitive science became very popular and it sort of fell by the wayside but I think recently there's been increased recognition of its importance particularly in kids with externalizing problems like ADHD. Okay and when you say externalizing problems just say what you mean by that. Yeah there are sort of problems like eight problems that you can see as a clinician, problems that are truthfully really out there. Beha behavioral. Behavioral, yeah, so like uh, conduct problems, being oppositional, being defined, that, that sort of class of problems. So w would you go so far as to say that this kind of emotion dysregulation is, is almost definitely there if the diagnosis is correct or is there a spectrum or there some kids where this is really just in your face and others where it's not so prominent? I think it's the latter. So I think emotional regulation is a continuous tree. You know, some kids are very good at it, some kids are in the middle, and some kids are very bad at it. Likewise with ADHD, I think there's the full spectrum. Some kids with ADHD are absolutely fantastic at regulating their emotions. It's just problems are much more frequent to these kids. If you think of emotion dysregulation as the problems with emotion that are really getting in the way of this child's performance at school, at home and with their peers, then it's probably around a third of children with ADHD that have that level of emotion dysregulation. That's really quite high. Yeah, that's a big number. Yeah, it's a big it number. So how do you think about it? I mean, this is occurring as the brain is maturing, but it's got a lot way, long way to go. Yeah. Uh, so, is this um, a biological difference, uh, or as many things are, both that uh, and the nature of the supportive or not so supportive environment and family? Yeah, I think it's going to be both. So um, my program is based really on the neuroscience of emotion regulation and dysregulation. So we use a lot of uh, brain imaging techniques to try to get into some of the neural features, the brain functions that underlie some of the basic processes, the building blocks of um, seeing an emotion, recognizing an emotion, the physiological arousal that comes from that emotion, and then dampening it down whenever that's appropriate. So I use a lot of brain imaging, but that doesn't at all negate the importance of the context. You know, we know very well from some very lovely classic longitudinal studies that look at how the interactions between a child with ADHD and their parents, they feed into each other this transaction between the two, and that has an enormous impact on the child's long-term outcome. So like most other things, it's going to be a combination of both. And, and can you sort of 
probably unfairly, but, but, but tell us a little bit about what are you finding using the imaging? What are you, what are you focusing on that may be the heart of the problem from a neuros, sort of neurobiological point of view? Yeah, so most of the work, uh, we, we look at brain structure. And I'll say that brain structure has really a very faint uh, signature of emotion dysregulation. As you get, so we look at the structure called the amygdala, which is like the emotional heart of the brain. And there we've been very interested in, are there any very subtle structural differences in the amygdala that might go along with emotion regulation and dysregulation? And we find there are very subtle ones. I think probably a more powerful technique has been used by other people, and that's brain functional imaging. So they look at things like, you know, which parts of the brain are activated whenever a child who's emotionally dysregulated or not is, is looking at a fearful face, for example. Many of those studies, for example, find that there's a network of structures deep in the brain, the limbic structures like the amygdala, uh, striatum, these deep, deep, deep processing structures that have a typical activation in these kids whenever they're viewing an emotionally charged stimulus. So here's a question. So one of the things that I've been interested in during my career is personality disorders. Mm -hmm. And so borderline personality disorder, as an example, is characterized by a lot of emotionality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's widely accepted that there is amygdala hyperactivity mm -hmm. in these patients. If I'm looking at one of these kids, is there any way you would look for a way to differentiate a kid who has ADHD who will be fine as an adult versus a kid who has ADHD and develops adult ADHD mm -hmm. versus a kid who has something that looks like ADHD but really turns out to be borderline personality disorder. And I realize that may not be a question that's answerable. Yeah, no, it's a, fa it's a fantastic question. And actually, ADHD research has got a long tradition of longitudinal studies. There's people like Raquel Klein in New York and you know, uh, Javier Castellanos in our group, actually, following these kids up as they grow into adulthood. So at the minute, what I can tell you is that from a baseline scan, from a childhood scan, it's pretty impossible to predict the outcome of a child. The hope is with multimodal imaging and richer measures of the context that these children are embedded in, we, we might get a bit closer there. My personal guess is that actually it's the trajectory, the, the developmental pathways. If we can capture that from sort of very high level imaging and recurrent measures of the environment, get a trajectory for this child, that might prove much more powerful in predicting where that child's going to end up rather than a snapshot at baseline. And I take it there's a lot of work going on trying to, to understand that. Exactly, yeah. It's the, it's the main focus of, of our uh, research group, actually. We're building up these trajectories of the connectome, for example, the different uh, functional and structural connections in the brain that support thought, how that's developing over time, and how that might predict a child's future outcome in terms of ADHD and their emotional well-being. And then just round numbers, uh, what percentage of kids with ADHD do persist and have adult ADHD? Yeah, so roughly, it's sort of looking as if it's going to be about a third, a third, a third. So a third may well have very persistent ADHD. Persistent ADHD, uh, the persistent childhood, often the hyperactivity and impulsivity gets a bit better, but inattention really persists. One third of individuals will have persisting symptoms that might not be numerous or severe enough to meet a full diagnosis, but they still get in the way of life. And probably a third have a pretty good remission from their ADHD. Okay. Okay. Well, that's actually really interesting. We've only touched the surface of what there must be to talk about, but it's just great to learn a little bit about it. This is a preview of coming attractions, which is, for some of us at least, to learn more about it tomorrow uh, and be able then to um, spread the word about helping people understand this. Uh, it's, it can be, not always, but it can be an extremely disruptive kind of situation with Real, real challenges for families trying to deal with and take care of and support and figure out what to do. Yeah. So I'm sure that the work you're doing involves also trying to get the right information out to help people. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's only by recognizing this symptom and building up a sort of very robust research program around it that we can start getting the right sort of treatments for these people who really are struggling. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to the more extended presentation that you'll make tomorrow, and thank you for the work that you do. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you all for joining us again, and we'll see you next time.